Brother Rowan Holt, welcome to Unitarian Anabaptist. Thank you, Tom. What a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here. Yes. I think you said we have met on occasion at a UCA conference? Yes. I'm pretty sure it was two years ago. Okay. At, uh, in Ohio. All right. So, um, well, anyhow, I'd, I'd like you to introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. So I'm uh, Rowan. Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest, just north of Seattle, although um, the observant will notice that my voice doesn't sound like a Seattle accent. I'm Australian and I've lived um, here up in the Northwest for uh, 13 years now, plus a three year stint almost a quarter of a century ago. So, you know, 15, 16 years, um, but I haven't lost my accent. Okay, um, that's fine. What else do you want to know? Okay, so what are your, what is your present preoccupation? You're going to school, you're studying theology. Yes. Um, okay, so I, I had a software background, software startups for the printing industry was, was my thing for 20 plus years. That's how I fed and educated my kids. Um, okay. And then um, as about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, uh, having sold my last startup, I um, started studying theology seriously, academically, um, and did a BA in biblical literature, um, an MA, and now I'm doing started a PhD uh, wow. with the University of Edinburgh long, you know, part time distance. So. so how did you decide that you wanted to dig deep in theology? What prompted you or what inspired inspired you to do this? Ah, good question. So I, um, I mean, I gave my life to the Lord seriously when I was 18. So at that from that point on with various hiccups and, and um, and, and small tangents, I'd, I'd say, I've my life's been surrendered to the Lord. So I've, you know, sought Him actively about what He wants me to do. And it was to my surprise in my mid twenties, where I felt directed to start a software company. The first I've had two software software startups, um, and business is not my thing, and it was not my interest. Um, so I mean, and I, I think anybody who knew me back then, uh, although there's. <laughs> It's really probably only family that does would know that that wasn't where I was headed. Um, in fact, I thought my wife and I were going to be missionaries. Perhaps huh. um, she had done some missionary work in India before we were married, and and I was excited by the challenge of, of something like that. Um, but surrendering to the Lord means you, you you sort of get what He tells you. Anyway, long story short, when He led me into um, software game, I um, you know I was still very interested in theology and sort of kept pursuing that as much as I sort of could on the side, but a software startup competing with big names in the printing industry like Kodak and oh. Heidelberg and Agfa and um, was, was pretty much a full-time gig. So it was when I sold the second startup that I sought the Lord and felt like I had permission to actually get some serious study. And, okay. um, and it was really good because it's been... A journey and I've changed a lot and I mean a lot has changed in my thinking in the last 10 years including some of the things we're going to talk about okay uh, just briefly you are a Unitarian Christian I am and, and, and um when did that it, come about well yeah um, somewhere in the last few years I started looking into it I think about 2016 and I, I know that because one of the first books I bought was um, James Dunn's Christology in the making and I looked recently on Amazon and saw that I bought that in March of 2016. So okay. I was still not, so I had been um, starting to inquire in it. It, it was a, a Facebook group, you know, face, social media is to blame for all of our problems um, <laughs> in the modern world. And one of them was, I was in a theology group and um, a guy challenged me, uh, he, he stopped believing the Trinity, which I you know, thought was, um, well, I was concerned for him. Because I've been raised you know, as a youngster, I was in the Anglican Church in Australia, and and that was you know, we were pretty big on the creeds and um, that side of liturgical Christianity, and I, you know, so I'd learnt and recited the creeds as a youngster, and and things had stuck with me that I, I thought this was an essential. Um, the thing was, as I started to investigate or started to discuss with him, I could not justify or every, why I thought that and um, and every um, basically it turned it turned fully around and I, I started to realize that the New Testament was not as clear on it as I thought 
I had never really investigated it. It had come up a few okay. times and I'd always been able to put it aside. I see. Okay. okay. So somewhere in the last 10 years, you know, eight years, perhaps five years, um, I've tr but I haven't really, you know, I mean, who do you talk about such things? I guess I am now since that UCA presentation. I see. Okay. So the, you, you wrote a couple papers. I read one of them. And it has to do with differentiating between culture or cultural, how would you describe it? Cultural Christianity and I think, I think if, if faith, I, uh, Christ, you know, your f Christian faith or, uh, please help me out here. So, well, I do, I do distinguish between the political mm -hmm. side political. and the theological side. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes, you talk so, about so, culture. You talk about culture too, but yes. So yeah. so, okay. So first of all, maybe you can explain what Western cultural Christianity is. Yeah, easy. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that sarcastically. <laughs> I, I guess I'm trying to um, sort of catch catch uh, uh, capture what we've talked about. So. That the paper you're referring to um, was about African, uh, I think I've got it in front of me, called Lessons from Africa's Christological Wrestling. And yes. um, part of what I do there is some of the points that are relevant to your question. Are, I point out that for some people, um, that Christianity or being a Christian is actually not a, a faith position. It's more, not even perhaps even religious as much as it's cultural or an ethnic position. And... Um, this, of course, when we're talking about Islam, um, is, is a very important distinction. Um, here in the West, in the modern West, we, we can easily distinguish, because I guess there's a growing number of secularists among us, that are still very much Westerners, and they even would, would have a strong Judeo-Christian um, cultural um, underpinning to their worldview, um, you know, even what's right and wrong within variances, um, but... Um, but they're certainly not Christian in the sense that you and I would, would, would identify ourselves as Christian, meaning we follow Jesus, we actually hang on his every word, we seek his approval, we, we live as if he is alive and interested in, you know, in our lives and ultimately will judge us and all humanity. That's yes. a very different type of Christianity to just being a Westerner um, born in America or Australia or somewhere you know, part sure. of the empire. Um, yes. So there's that side of it. Then um, I'm contrasting and going historically, looking at the development of that sort of Christianity uh, from the first century witness that we find in, in the New Testament and how the first couple of centuries of Christianity, followers of Christ, were persecuted by the Roman state, they were persecuted by the Jewish uh, religious establishment. Um, there, it, it wasn't one unified um, body. It, there was a whole lot of different views and it was more like a house church movement growing. Um, and, and part of what they were known for historically was, I think um, Tom Holland, I think it is, uses the word they were, they were known for something that in ancient civilization was quite rare, mercy. They were merciful people. They you know, saved people that had no, you know, uh, from, from hardships, that had no benefit to themselves. It was, you know, they were true, you know, to all appearances, they were trying to follow uh, what Jesus actually taught in the Sermon of the Mount, for example, um, it's sacrificing themselves and their own well-being for each other and for others. Um, and that sort of Christianity grew and, and it was observed by pagans who sometimes were even involved in martyring these people oh. that they would not suffer um, for their religion like these Christians were. And so part of what converted people, it seems, is that these Christians appeared to live a, a life that showed that, that their faith wasn't just a cultural uh, yes. setup, that uh -huh. it actually meant something them beyond death. It was more important to them to be faithful to Jesus, even at the expense of their life, where if you didn't really believe your religion, you wouldn't do something like that. Sure. Um, by the time you get to Nicaea and Chalcedon, the, the following century, and and that whole the Christianity changed. Um, 
it once upon a time to be martyred was was um, a privilege, if you like, and the state persecuted you. Now, after Constantine and, and the changes there, it, prestigious, it, you know, there, there was prestige associated with with Christianity of of that state type, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of people left and became monks. A lot of sincere people who knew they weren't going to be martyred anymore, but they knew that Christianity wasn't shouldn't be cheap, you know. Like like Bornhofer talks about in cheap grace in one of his books. Um, so they 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 sought this ascetic life to be faithful, um, and, and Christianity fundamentally changed, and it became um, very much about theology, and, um, and it got associated with the philosophical mindset of the Greek uh, world and the Greek Roman world. Okay. Yeah, there's there's an answer. Yes, so, so that's that is very very interesting and very important that you mention that shift. So, can you describe the primitive, if you want to call it like the primitive mindset of the early Christians, if they weren't thinking about deep philosophical thoughts, what was filling their mind and their faith perspective? Well, I think it might be most obvious if we put ourselves in the shoes of the earliest followers of Jesus, you know, Peter, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James, uh -huh. John. I mean, they weren't thinking about philosophical constructs. They weren't trying to, to wonder how three could be one and vice versa, or how uh, Jesus could be both man and God and the dual natures. And none of that was... was I, I don't think, especially when you read the synoptics, it just doesn't come up. They were um, coming to understand that Jesus was, well, a prophet, but more than a prophet. He was uh, kingly um, and messianic, but not in the way their expectations were. So there was a wrestling match going on with all of them about who, who this man was. They, you know, he was a teacher. I think that was pretty clear. Uh, he was a miracle worker, and uh, and they were called to follow him, and that meant, um, well, to to the to the first century um, mind, uh, being a disciple was like being an apprentice. So it wasn't about just learning, you know, Bible verses or theological creeds. It was actually living with Jesus, eating with him, training under him, so that you could be like him, so you could imitate him. Paul urges his readers, you know, in the 50s, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I think the more I read the Gospels, Jesus was saying, imitate me as I imitate God. Uh, and, uh, you know, yes. in John's prologue, yes. we even end up with, with Jesus being, you know, no one's ever seen God, but the closest you're ever going to, to get is looking at Jesus. Yes. And, it's, and that's supposed to be us, isn't it, really? Yes, beautifully put. So the... The concept of a Messiah would have been something very large in their mind. Messianic expectation was 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 thick in the air, um, but we have, I think, all the Gospels make it pretty clear that that conflicting ideas on on what that meant, you know, until you literally have Peter. You know, in, in, in the middle of some of the synoptics, sort of, you know, Jesus saying, who do the people say I am? And hearing mm -hmm. those, and then who do you say I am? And Peter comes out with a, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes. And, um, I mean, that's an incredible revelation. Jesus acknowledges it as uh, flesh and blood. has not, yes. not shown you this, um, but God has. And then um, uh, Jesus uh, follows that immediately by and I'm going to go up and suffer terrible things in Jerusalem and Peter rebukes him <laughs> so Peter identifies him as being the Messiah but it seems that he had a certain thing in mind when he said that so Jesus could identify with the titles but not identify with the expectation there and um, I mean this has been talked about a lot over the years about what sort of Messiah Jesus was going to be. I think it's still something that the, um, the Jews bring up it in is. terms of um, why they don't believe in the Messiah, many of them, is because the Messiah wasn't supposed to die like that, wasn't supposed to do that. Um, yes. In fact, I had a conversation with Rabbi Tovia Singer last week. Cool. And he brought up that very same thing. 
at the end of the interview. So why did Jesus have to die in your <laughs> view? Wow. Um, well, I think it, there's something, you know, we could talk forever on this. Um, and I know you've got some thoughts on this too. Yes. I think it's, it's clear that, that he had to die for sins. It, it says that in the New Testament. What that means, though, and some people will try to say that was just the sins of the Jews. Um, and, I mean, basically, we, we, we're, we're dipping our toe in atonement theories here. Um, and I, I see a lot of merit in a lot of these ideas. I mean, if the Jews had accepted Jesus as the Messiah, we may have had a very different outcome. Um, <laughs> he may not have died. Oh, I've heard other people suggest, and some of these, I mean, some of these hypotheticals can get quite uh, odd. Somebody else I've heard, I've heard suggested that if Jesus wasn't was accepted and wasn't going to be crucified, that they, he would have to go in into the temple and be sacrificed by the priests. Oh, yeah. So, you know, what they're basing that on, I guess, is the expectation is that a payment had to be made, which I don't see so clearly, or certainly not as clearly as I was raised to see it. I, I. I do think there's um, there's a lot of merit to um, the moral government the governance view, the moral government view of the atonement, which basically says that God wants to forgive people. Just like you know, you've been crossed by people in your life, uh, enemies and loved ones. We all have, and we can choose to forgive. In fact, we're ordered to forgive. It's it's right there in the Lord's prayer, isn't it? That yes, I you know, forgive me as I forgive forgive others. It's it's. It sounds like it's core moral teaching. Um, yes. And, and God can do the same. The difference, of course, between, um, let's say, you and your spouse is your spouse or whoever's forgiving you or you're forgiving them um, is not a governor, is, is not got a public role um, where God does. And so that's, I guess, the, the one difference where... G uh, Jesus dying uh, may have some relevance for God's public office where he needs to maintain the fact that there still is right and wrong and a private grievance could be just forgiven, just a pure choice. But a public grievance may need some other statement, some other objective um declaration that shows that this is not a weakening of the law if, for instance i've heard it described as if the law says that a fundamental and we're talking about the law of moses but perhaps even natural law of the universe is that if you do something wrong you deserve punishment um right you know um but i and i have done something wrong i can talk very <laughs> experientially about this but i don't believe i'm going to be punished i'm certainly hopeful that i won't be punished why is that when natural law and the law of moses says if you do you know the, the soul that sins should die you know in ezekiel 18 i think it is yes, um right. and so have i done something wrong yes should i die perish you know in, in terms of a, of of an ultimate perishment well no i don't believe so why is it because god's arbitrary in his law no is it because God's law isn't good and, and isn't necessary. No, it's very important. The, the, and I'm summing up the law in, in the way Jesus and Paul did, that to love God with all our heart is the due duty of man and to love our neighbour as ourself is only appropriate as well. Um, and, and I have sinned against both of those things in my life. Can God just forgive me? I think on a personal level, he's my dad, he absolutely could. Perhaps on the, in the public sphere, that he um, that something needed to be done to show that it wasn't simple or that God's ar not, not being arbitrary and that his law isn't powerless. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not sure I'm doing it justice. Yeah, so that's not too far from like the idea of justification, I guess, right? That, that you know, we, you talk about the idea that, or, you know, the, the idea that, a just God to paint uh, a just God is going to require payment for something, something well, pay like that justification um, I, I, I know what you I think I so, know what so, you're here, to so, so here's the here's I guess when, when I when this topic comes up hmm. and you know that so much so much of, of these this theorizing pertains to uh, 
this idea that God is angry with sin and his justice demands payment and so forth. Um, but it seems to me that it's more, it's more actually more difficult for us to believe that God is able to forgive us. We, we, the, it seems like the problem is more on our part. Like we, we have difficulty believing that God is actually capable of forgiving us. <laughs> and yeah. and that's, that seems to be, and, and so, so it, it, it's not enough to say, well, God is able to forgive your sins and we're able to accept this and just, whereas, it, and of course, Jesus was not, Jesus was crucified by the rulers of this world. He was crucified by the Roman governors and the, and, and with the, with the, sanct, with the uh, approval of the Jewish leaders. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really God that did the crucifying. It was wicked rulers who actually killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and so, of course, God knew this was going to happen, but you can't blame God for knowing it was going to happen. <laughs> Well, so. I mean, according to the scriptures, there's a phrase that I think Paul uses and I think others use there. So he was crucified according to the scriptures. So there was some some foreknowledge and foretelling in, in God's plan to some of it. It's hard to, to know exactly how much. But I think you're touching on a, a really important point, though, is that it's our understanding of forgiveness is sometimes clouded or can be clouded by certain atonement theories that make God out to be a bloodthirsty... Yeah. You know, there's got yeah. to be, yeah, and I, I think, and that's really, really important to me, is that God is not um, a bloodthirsty type no. of God and, and, that demands blood sacrifices for some sort right. of... Right, uh, that's actually very strange to think that God would require a blood sacrifice, isn't it? Especially, especially when he's, he was being crucified by wicked men who were not having a regard for God's will. So the men did the murdering, and God did the raising from the dead, right? right? God raised him from the dead. So in a sense, well, in the true sense of the word, God is actually vindicating his son. His oh, son was killed because he, he made this messianic claim. And, they, and basically, they, by killing them, they said, no, you're not the Messiah. We're going to kill you. And that's the end of you. And mm -hmm. God, in a sense, is responding to them by saying, look, you killed him, but I'm going to raise him from the dead. <laughs> So, and that's, and Paul is, Paul is referencing this Adam Christology, second Adam or last Adam Christology mm. it, 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 it with respect to this. So, um, anyway, I, I, I'm not, I'm interviewing you, but I'm just interjecting some thoughts here. The, the Christus, I, I the Christus Victor, I, yeah, Christus Victor uh, kind of understanding seems to be one of those things that, that shines through. Absolutely. That touches on so many points. And, and in that paper, the African Christology one, it talks about how aligned the Christus Victor view is with some of these African um, understandings of the cross. They, they just find the same scriptures that you and I have and our traditions have had for centuries. And uh -huh. they just read it slightly differently with a different emphasis. And one of them is the Christus Victor. I, just, I guess I wanted to point out, too, that there is the Bible talks about wrath. Uh, against sinners, but I think the mistake you're making, uh, or not you, this this the mistake you're identifying out there is is that often us uh, Christians who we, we recognise we're sinners and we're coming to God fully aware of that, that we've got no righteousness of our own with which to approach Him, we can still feel burdened by guilt and sin and think God's got a wrathful attitude towards us. It's it's actually that's not the case repentance i think i guess i i would say that repentance is per, perhaps the one thing i'm absolutely sure on from the scriptures and yes. from from logic yes. and reasoning is the requirement of god yes and then absolutely. what how else he forgives us and whether the a, a blood sacrifice of his son was required or just occasioned um but as i read apocalyptic literature some of which is in the bible and some of which is sort of in between the testaments what becomes very clear is that God, there is God, is angry, but He's not angry with repentant people who are desiring no. to, to. He's angry with kings and 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 uh, 
the mighty people and oh, i'm yes. thinking of now of of uh some of the the works in in one enoch in the enoch tradition these people are going to suffer um god's full judgment um because of yes. how they you know killed yes. his son and they shed the blood of his people right they shed um, the blood of the innocents yes yes throughout the and ages second maccabees i think as as this come out too is that basically there's a developing theme throughout Jewish history that Jew, uh, you know, there's multiple themes. One theme is that God's people keep on and doing the wrong thing and worshipping other gods and, and doing that. And that's certainly part of it. Not all everybody. Of course, there's a remnant. But then how are these other nations, some of whom God calls in to judge them and try to bring correction. God's judgment is not some vin vindictive, no. angry, um, no. as much as it is corrective. He wants, he needs his witness his people to be a witness to to all nations. Um, we, we see that when God's saying, I'm going to judge these people for making the golden calf, Moses. And Moses says, remember, the Egyptians are watching because um, you just did a lot of work there. I'm trying to let them know the, the, the power of Yahweh. And God says, yeah, you're right. I won't do it the way, that way. I'll do it a different way. There's still going to be judgment, though. Um, yes. And so uh, and, and but there's certainly going to be judgment on the wicked and the, the the unrepentant and especially those who had power and authority given them delegated by god to look after the weak and, yes. and the the yes. um powerless the the poor the widow the orphan these things that constantly come up in scriptures as 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 people that god recognizes are vulnerable and need to be looked after and jesus yes. didn't he say in matthew 24 or whatever he will judge and separate the sheep from the goats yes more or less based on how people dealt with these types who represented himself to them you know the least of of your brethren sort of thing yes that's so yeah. that's so so well put that's so well put um so the this idea of the in, of innocent blood being shed throughout the ages mm. is 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 something that that is occurring and God is watching the shedding of innocent blood and usually the shedding of innocent blood is being done by the rulers of this world and by you know like most famously um Antiochus Epiphanes is that is that correct uh yeah. am I saying that yep. correct where He's he's slaughtering these these worshippers of Yahweh and you know he's asking well where is your God is your God going to save us from my sword I'm going to kill you and so forth and it's interesting my Jewish friend told me that that the response that was given by some of these Jews mm -hmm. was yeah you're going to kill me that's true mm -hmm. but but I'm going to rise from the dead and mm -hmm. you're not because God is going to God is going to vindicate the innocent blood that is shed on this earth. And, That's, and I think you're referring to a story in, in, in Second Maccabees. Which I, haven't, uh, I wrote a paper, just again, an internal paper years ago, a few years ago, on, I think I was something about the Gospel of Mark. Um, and I was looking at uh, the suffering servant theme. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it came up... Uh, particular word greek word that was used in mark um for the handing over of the innocent to 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 the forces of evil um was the same word used in maccabees for these i think it was seven brothers of this mother who were being you know who were standing up and not obeying epiphanes uh the guy uh -huh. who was i think pretty much the abomination that makes desolation in in the temple right um yes. I, I'm not sure I'm remembering all this okay. right, but they, okay. they, they were there with their mum, and um, and he was expecting them to back down, and they were were not. And um, okay. and the mother right. showed incredible courage, and yeah, these guys would rather die, and they expected now. But there was some statement there that somehow, again, I'm not doing it justice, but um, okay. that perhaps the shedding of their blood might. Um, turn away the wrath too so mm -hmm. there's still some yes. inclination. there is yeah it's... there is the the zedek uh zedek the blood of the righteous is 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 has a quality to it that that 
Does the word justifies or it's there is there is something that happens hmm. when innocent blood is shed. God has regard for innocent blood. Yeah, and I think you're talking about how Jesus was vindicated. I think the wrath of God is proven necessary when when innocent blood is is shed. It's like yes, we we, we could we could point the finger at a God who was was uh, judging people, perhaps, unless he's absolutely just to do so. If 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 innocent blood is being shed by people who actually should right. Be taking right. care of people. I mean, right. it right. goes right back to the original mandate. Why did God create man and you know, to to take dominion of the earth? And we can think of that again as as Westerners, modern Westerners, and think, oh, that means take dominion and, and stake our claim, put a flag in, and defend no, our no, territory. No, 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 That's no, right. no, no, it's, no, no. It's quite different, actually. Those who are taking on the mantle of responsibility have an obligation to do so as God's emissaries or his representatives. Exactly. So, so, yeah, in the case of Jesus, like the Roman governor should have had compassion on Jesus, who was only doing good. Like, he was not a political threat. And, and, the, and the Jewish leaders, too, they, they sh it, was, it was a very, like, among crimes, this was the biggest crime in humanity that... that could ever occur where you're going to take this innocent man who is doing miracles, he's healing people, giving sight to the blind and raising the dead, and, and you're going to murder him? For what? Yep. <laughs> right? So, so it's, it seems to me that God has tolerated the shedding of much innocent blood. Mm. And in the case of Jesus, it was almost like God is making a statement. He says, enough is enough. He's not going to stay dead. <laughs> no. I'm going to raise him, and I'm going to make him Lord over all of humanity. Like, think of that. Think of that. Like that contradiction. That you know, because because Jesus died in a sense for doing good. He yeah. was too good to to. He was too good for the rulers of this world, mm -hmm. and they refused to submit to the his goodness. So, it reminds me of Hebrews, isn't it? Hebrews 11. After all the all the great people of faith, he goes through, people of whom the world was not worthy, you know, yes. they'd rather wander out in the, in the wilderness and, and live in caves, yes. you know, than be identified with this wicked generation sort of thing. It's a constant theme, isn't it? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so this, this most, most righteous man, Jesus, mm -hmm. is made Lord of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, that's so much like the character of God, isn't it? Isn't it? He takes yeah. the lowly and the and the, the humble and, and exalts them. Yes, you know, yes which yes. is I'm, I'm now remembering. You know that was part of Mary's song. I think in Luke's gospel, when when you know the angel uh -huh. tells her what's going to happen, she has this thing that you know this song or poem or whatever it is mm -hmm. that again talks about this very thing that the mighty and and those in authority are going to be brought low and yes. you're going to do exalt. And that's I think a, a Miriam song. Or was it Miriam or? The, the song uh, after Moses led the people through the, um, it's a similar Red thing. It's, so it's, yes. it's pretty ancient throughout the whole idea is that God created man to take care of his planet, to, to bring, to continue to bring order and peace and harmony to uh -huh. you know, what God had created in the garden. He appointed man to take, men and women, of course, to, to take elsewhere. And that can only be done with the character of God, you know, yes. through justice and kindness and mercy and love. And, um, and pretty early on, you know, you've even got Cain um, being tempted to sin against his brother who, who had a, a more pleasing sacrifice and God counseling him like a loving father would. You don't have to go this route. You know, you've got to tangle with, with sin and your temptation and stuff like that. But as, as you, you've made a point, but, not interfering, letting innocent blood be, sh be shed. That's yeah. God's really given responsibility to mankind. And, um, and so blood will be spilt, but, there's, but there will be an end to it. And as you've said, I think the tables were turned <laughs> yes. in a, a dramatic way three days after that event with Jesus. And we're now, you and I, um, we're waiting for the next 
yes. major stage, you know, the trumpets and, and the resurrection of, of all of the righteous. Um, yeah, so, so let me ask you this now. So, hmm. so do you see the resurrection of Jesus as actually the ev well, evidence, first of all, the evidence that such a God, a God of mercy and truth exists, and that he has the power to actually change the change the order of things like mm -hmm. does god exist and is he able to bring a new creation that and does the resur resurrection of jesus actually answer those those two questions yeah yeah i, I think so um and i think importantly two thousand years later it's hard to you know Understand, as you mentioned very early on in our in our talk here, how how long it is after the fact, and and how hard it is to sort of look through time and separate our own culture and our own understanding uh -huh. of, of even you know we're, we're scientific. We, I got raised with the idea of how rockets, you know, and and planes fly, and and how you know modern science, and that was not the mindset of, of ancient people. Um, and two thousand years later, would I, if Jesus had just risen from the dead? and then gone to heaven would i believe it now possibly not except for his disciples so having realized that sort of later on in life you know as as my you know i've got a healthy skeptical side to me as i, I think anybody living in the the modern world needs um to sort of try to distinguish misinformation from from truth um when jesus started calling these disciples and he started to try to shape them um, as we read about it. And then you have him, you know, Mark's gospel again in classic is, is Jesus is, is saying, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and suffer. I think he says it three times and suffer and be killed. Meanwhile, very close to that somewhere in the, in the narrative, you've got his disciples arguing about who's the most powerful. You know, can we sit at your right and your left hand? The two brothers are asking just after Jesus had done that. And it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's shocking to hear that, that our obsession with power, and obviously they didn't get it they, they, until they saw Jesus raised from the dead, until they see him go yeah, through that. And right. then, but while, they, but while they're still not getting it, and they're saying, can we sit at your right and your left hand in your kingdom? Jesus says to them point blank, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? <laughs> can you? And they, ignorant to what they're saying, go, yeah, we can drink it. And Jesus goes, hmm, you will. <laughs> and so so not only was Jesus' death critical uh, for us, and I think, as you said, it's the greatest travesty in history. It's the, the, the idea of an innocent man, especially an innocent man who was not only innocent, but reflected God's uh, beauty yes. in, in powerful miracles of healing and, and restoration of life and, and yes. the most incredible ethical statements, you know, trying to understand morality, You'll never get deeper, I don't think, than do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. There is there's a full stop after that that, that doesn't need, you know, that that whether you're you're five years old or ninety five years old, that can sum up the the extent of ethics you need, I think. Um, yes. And so Jesus needed to be this guy suffering and dying guaranteed that that message was going to yes. last right right but having his followers see that observe that wrestle with that and then fall on their knees to the risen messiah right. and then be prepared to die again i think it's necessary it was necessary it was they who could re, uh, record that or influence you know the people who recorded that for you and i be able to read the bible um and for them to be able to to imitate him. You know, we know James died, we know Peter died, we know Paul died, we know many of these disciples suffered terrible deaths themselves. Yes. And you don't do that if you're aware that it's a con or, you know, for all the um, non sincere reasons that, that, that people have done all sorts of things that they might suffer, you know, to save their loved ones. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that somebody might suffer and yes. voluntarily do that to, to hide a lie but you don't do it for the reasons they did so i think that was more important um and jesus knew that from the scrap from the word go too i think so this was a pattern of behavior that existed in the early followers of jesus they were the disciples of jesus were imitating jesus you mentioned jesus was actually in a sense imitating 
the character of God, although God cannot die, but the good character of God was reflected by Jesus and then passed to the disciples and then the early followers of the, of the apostles were following in that pattern as well. And so this was, so what, what would you say as far as like the idea of following Jesus as Lord, is this a political statement? In the in the Roman world, like they're giving they're giving their allegiance to Jesus. Can they give their allegiance to Caesar in in that in a in an equal capacity? Or what's what's happening here? Oh, that's a good question too. Uh, again, your Anabaptist leanings are sort of shining through here because <laughs> that's something I wrestle with, and I, I I don't claim to be an authority there. I, I I do, so I might not go as far as some you know. Anabaptist or Mennonite types. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I, I, I think Christianity takes all forms, a lot of forms, doesn't it? Um, yes. Because I think that it's, it's interesting that, for instance, Paul in Romans 13 talks about honouring the people with power. Yes. Um, you, he points out that they've got a sword and they've got it for a reason. He points out that their authority is given them from God. Um, and yet we know from history they killed him. Right, um, right. And, and, and presumably, unless we've been told some tall stories, that they, they killed him for not doing anything worthy of death. Right, you know, he was, right. he was obeying God. Yes. So I think there comes a point. So I think if we bounce off that, following the state or, or, or righteous laws, laws that actually reflect God's character, uh, the obligation um, and um, I mean even Jesus said things like that um, very very crudely in uh, not crudely um, uh, what was I trying to say wisely I guess uh, shrewdly Sorry, okay. Okay. Um, who, who's whose head is on the denarii you know coin in Caesar's or give unto Caesar that which is Caesar, you know when he was trying to be cornered when they were trying to corner him so there's this there's this awkward um, balance where we uh, have got a foot in this world and righteous laws or laws that are not forbidden from God are absolutely required for us to follow and yet there's lines we won't cross you know and, and the, I think the early apostles in, um, in Acts when they're healing and they're doing stuff that Jesus wanted them to do and the religious leader says okay well go on your way but don't do any more of that they said well you tell us are we supposed to obey man or God um, right, right. So a lot of the time when, 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 when the state or the man with the sword says, do not kill people, that aligns with what God says, right? Do yes. not steal. Do not cheat. Yes. Do not cheat on your wife. Do not take another man's wife. Do not cause strife. And the Ten Commandments, are uh, well, most of them are a good summary of that. Um, that yeah, we, we can uh, obey that. And um, now... Should the tax rate be ten percent or twenty percent, or should I don't? God doesn't get involved in such details, and um, and I, I don't think um, that we're at liberty then to, you know, I guess in America we get to vote for the politicians we think are going to do what's right. Supposedly that's a whole yeah. deep thing, um, uh, but yeah, that there's a, there's lines where the state can ask us or require of us things that God will not do, uh, or God forbids. Um, yes. The Bible. The Old Testament, of course, is full of, of stories of people being you know, forced to, to worship statues, which the Jews aren't going to do, um, or to honour certain you know, other religious practices. Um, and that's where they drew the line. And um, in Jesus' case, he was going to bring life and healing and restoration and all the things that his father was about, even on the Sabbath, because he wasn't buying into the religious leaders of the day and their co-opting of the Sabbath to become something we're not. And, and I talk about this in, I'm not sure much, so much uh, sure in my African paper as I do in the, uh, the UCA presentation, that um, uh, trying to put a fence around the Torah was asking more, you know, trying to bring the Messiah sooner. Let's make sure we're erring on the side of caution, which sounds really good. And, and, and I'm sure it had a lot of um, good motivations behind it, but actually, if you're making it harder for people to enter the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus said they were doing, um, 
Or, you know, you, you travel across land and sea to make one disciple, but you're making twice as much a son of hell as, as you yourselves are, which is, again, incredibly strong language that I'm yes. uncomfortable saying. Jesus right. said it. Um, yes. There's, You can go too far. You can make it hard for people to enter the kingdom of God. And, um, and that's something we should be wary of. Um, anyway, I, I think I, I switched tracks there. That's on, okay. On, that's okay. You know, this is kind of a free will, free willing conversation. We had some things in, in mind to talk about. I'm not quite sure we're going to get get to that subject matter this time around. We might have to do this again, but um, maybe we can we can go into into the direction then to talk about to get to at least get a a, a start point at at maybe a future conversation. Mm -hmm. So what from the from the Roman when, when, when Christianity was institutionalized as the religion of Rome, as mm -hmm. it happened in the fourth and fifth fifth century, mm -hmm. what what was then? Can you describe the pol like the political aspect of Christianity? How things changed when Christianity became part of the politics of Rome? Well, I'll tell you what I understand. Um, so for a long time, yeah, it, it was, being a Christian was not something that um, the state was cool with. You know, it, it seemed to uh, originally identify with, with Judaism, which, which the state had given a pass to for traditional reasons. Um, but when it started to be distinguished from that, um, then it was a, a new religion that couldn't um, benefit from the, you know, the caveats that had been made for the worshippers of, of Jehovah or Yahweh, the one God, you know. Um, and so then they were basically considered to be, I think some people considered them to be atheists because they wouldn't participate in all these state religious ceremonies. I mean, and everything was religious back then, you know. The, you Every football match, you know, or gladiator match, whatever it might have been, every um, public event opened with religious ceremony to certain gods, um, including the emperor, um, who had, you know, become deified over the centuries. And, um, and there was uh, their whole um, symposium type. A lot of social gatherings were done in houses it's, uh, where there was feasting and drinking and toasting to the gods, uh, the gods of wine. And again, I think the emperor was a big part of that. And the, the early Christians had a problem with, with this, as the Jews did, but the early Christians stopped being able to um, be excused like the Jews were. And eventually, I think, uh, I think early in the 4th century, very early in the 4th century, around there, the um, religious freedom was granted um, to Roman citizens. And then, I think it was only a decade or two, Maybe three. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm rusty on the numbers. Um, was was Christianity became the state religion? It was fairly quick, but it was two distinct events. Um, and and the first I applaud, obviously. Uh, I think that um, I, I point out in the African paper actually that it was wasn't until the 1960s um, that the Catholic uh, what was it the Second Vatican Council said the same thing. Um, if I quote, freedom of conscience and tolerance for other religions was something the Second Vatican Council brought in the 1960s. Um, prior to then, they'd had a pretty dogmatic approach. You know, if, if you weren't a Catholic, you weren't, you know, a friend of God, um, which, of course, leaves us Protestants and, and all that pretty out in the cold. And, and um, that's taking time to filter down. But certainly the, the, the Roman situation changed fairly rapidly once Christianity stopped being criminalised to then being authorized and um, associated with empirical power or imperial power. Where basically, I think one of the authors I've read, um, Hansen, I think it is, um, talks about, or maybe he's just quoting somebody else, that, that uh, Constantine was considered to be like the 13th apostle. You know, <laughs> that this, this emperor, perhaps more because of his, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek, because of the power uh, he brought to the table rather than his deep theological knowledge 
or, or long relationship with God. He wasn't baptized until on his deathbed. Um, like a lot of those guys used to do, they used, I think they wanted to hedge their bets. They, they had baptism. Their understanding of baptism was a, a washing away of sin in a, um, an ontological sense. Oh. So even, um, yeah, so oh. many of those older guys would leave baptism to the last possible moment to sort oh. of, you know, it wasn't an entrance ride. It was a washing of sins ride. I see. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So uh, before we close this interview out, I, I think it's important now to distinguish between the, the, the deep theological and philosophical type of Christianity from the friendship with God. So can you make a contrast? Um, this, this will maybe give us a lead into God willing and the next conversation we have when we can get into the African topic a little bit more in detail. But mm. distinguish between institutionalized religion and its, its ordinances and the idea of alternatively being brought into a relationship with God. I, th I think perhaps maybe a, a good way of thinking about this is, is just reading the synoptic gospels. And I, and I, I guess I'm going to focus on the synoptics there because of their uh, comparative easiness to understand. You know, they're, they're pre-written as, as historical narratives that outline what Jesus did and what, it, what he said. And he makes specific claims about the kingdom of God and and the ethics or the morals of the of that kingdom and what you know what we should do people come and say what should I have you know how, how can I have eternal life and um, and his answers if you, if you really just for a while I'd recommend every, any one of your, your listeners to to just spend time just go through the synoptic so even just pick a synoptic and read it from cover to cover, again and again and again. Just give yourself a month or two of of deep meditation on that. It, it's because it's so often will go against. I guess part of what you're pointing to is it goes against what got institutionalized by the church, and gets filtered down even to to really good churches full of faithful people. They get we've been affected by religion, and so so Jesus says. Follow the commandments, you know. <laughs> and I think one of the stories, the guy says, I've, I've done all that. What else should I do? Identifying a certain need. And, and then Jesus goes further and says, okay, you have to give everything, you know, to the poor and then come and follow me. And he walks away in this particular scenario because he was very wealthy. And Jesus doesn't follow him and doesn't, well, if you say this creed and if you say certain Hail Marys or if you get baptized, there's none of that. Um, there's none of this sugarcoating, I guess I could say, or it's probably not a good phrase, or this um, <laughs> this institutionalized religion in terms of um, where it becomes a transaction, which reflects okay. a little bit again on our soteriological atonement theory stuff. Is, yeah. is, I, I, I think there's a problem with what, when you try to institutionalize religion, you come, you, you start to take forms and you can't not have forms. Human beings, we create culture. That's what we do. We, you know, um, and that and culture exists in forms. But we start to mistake these forms for what they represent and for the content that they're communicating. And so, baptism has is a form that represents something that the Bible talks about. And we then start baptizing babies, you know. And and the Jews did it with circumcision, you know. You can. And, and and just even having the temple made them think, oh, we're pretty we're pretty special because we've got yeah. the temple, God's presence, and and God sent prophets to say, even my temple's going to be destroyed if you guys don't start to do what I actually tell you. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? So there's this understanding that having a relationship with God is not about external forms, about having the temple or having the appearances or even being circumcised, because even Moses, if you read Deuteronomy, talks about circumcision of the heart. Right, way back right, then. right, right, right. So, you know, you can think of circumcision of the heart being contrasted with the Old Testament understanding of circumcision of, of, of the flesh or the foreskin, but actually even Moses is bringing up the circumcision that God wants is of the heart. 
it's a it's a separateness it's a yes. we're concerning ourselves as human beings with our original call our original call and the reason we're created was to do what god wants to do on planet earth is to reflect his character as yes. we rule in his name as his vice regents as we we, we make dominion and we bring, bring the order that God brought to Eden to the rest of the world. Yes. And we'd rather die than do anything else rather than kill. And that's, <laughs> I guess, the most obvious or overt, perhaps uh, crass way of pointing out the distinction here is Jesus would rather have died than to dishonor his father and to disobey him. And right. he was going to say the words that would cost him his life. He was going yes. to point to the powerful people and yes. their hypocrisy, knowing it would cost him his life, and that was okay with Jesus, where some of the institutional leaders of later yeah. Christendom went, were going to bring the enemies of, of the gospel, in their understanding, to their knees, and were going to right. kill, and right. they were going to rule by the sword, which is exactly what Satan tempted Jesus with. More or less, if you bow down before me, I will make you, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And that would have been yes. the end. That would have been a, a, a rulership of the law of oh, sorry, of the sword. That would have been might makes right. That would have been horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Jesus trusting God that God will somehow bring a kingdom to pass without that approach um, would rather die. And then we see how that plays out is that God raises him from the dead, as you've said, exalts yeah. him to power, puts him above every authority yes. under the father in heaven and on earth yes. and will come and bring his kingdom to the to the earth um raising all of the people that i, I guess have proven that their yes. loyalty to to god is of a similar kind they are in christ because they live like christ that was so beautifully done thank you for that yes. well, i just i just happen to think that Jesus probably could have come into Jerusalem with an army. He probably could have gotten followers to help him overthrow Rome and, and do the things that were expected of Messiah to do. And, and yet he didn't. He, he, just, he just demonstrates, as you say, something so very polar opposite to anything that the rulers of this world would do when they're trying to take power. Mm. And it's so strange that this later becomes that you know Christianity becomes the the religion of the Roman Empire where they're going to march with the cross of Christ into battle and they're going to expect that that this they're, they're going to they're going to have the victory because they're f you know somehow following Christ that's so strange isn't it? it yeah the word irony um comes to mind but it doesn't feel I don't feel like it does justice to no to the depravity of that, you know, to the right, amount of bloodshed, right, you know, right, right, right. Certainly ironic though. So, I mean, it's, so, yeah. So to lead, we're not going to get deep into the African topic tonight, but just to, as a, as a teaser, the hmm. idea that Christian colonial powers hmm. would invade Africa and at the same time, they're trying to spread Christianity in that continent. They're enslaving people and mm. and taking the natural resources of the country and so forth. It's uh, th there is a similar kind of irony going on there, is there not? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not black and white. It's just like most things in history. It's truly messy. Um, uh -huh. Because you, I'm sure some of those priests. Um, and missionaries and Jesuits and, 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 and the types that when I'm sure many of them were well-meaning, genuine people who had no other um, resource with which to go to Africa and, and, and to defend themselves or to not die on, you know, putting their foot on the, the soil from the, you know, the, a, a, um, a violence with the natives or whatever. They, they would go along with whatever imperial venture. So the kings generally probably, again, with two minds, I want gold and I want ivory and I want wealth and I want status. These things that tend to drive people in political positions. Perhaps some of them were sincere Christians as well and thought because of the corrupted uh, nature of power that I, I think in my paper I mentioned that Augustine really was the first guy to really make a Christian uh, argument for using power 
to save people from, you know, if we use a little bit of, I uh, say power, I think he used the word mild floggings. If we can use mild floggings to convert these people and save them from hell, the idea of an eternal torture, then we're actually doing good. So if God can torture people uh, into, you know, obedience, then then we can use a more mild form. So, you know, that, that filtered down. So perhaps even well-meaning kings and people in authority yes, were yes. sending priests and other representatives of the church it's just truly messy but they were you know yeah and so some of them um actually stood against the imperial powers and i, I forget the circumstances now but i remember reading about one priest or, or or bishop or whoever it was that was writing back to the monarch about the atrocities done to the locals and it actually changed, so, Ch so changed. It could, there was a context in which the Spaniards were enslaving, enslaving people in the New World, enslaving Indian native peoples in the New World. Okay. And there, there was a priest that stood up and wrote back to the powers back at home. Okay. That said, we have to, yeah, to yeah. that we have to stop doing this to the native peoples. So the answer to that was get slaves out of Africa and bring right. them here instead of, instead of the natives. I know, <laughs> so, I know. So, you know, so, it, yeah. it's quite, quite interesting, yeah. The but, but so there's that. been well-meaning priests and, and yes. people, and but 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 again, it's it's irony. It's it's too bloody to be called irony. But yeah, so you've got ultimately what you've got is a lot of African peoples, who whose understanding of of Europeans were they were brutal. They had this foreign god, and they are enslaving us and trying to force their religion upon us and force. I, it, the whole mixture, the whole combination was quite ho horrible. And just the antithesis to what Jesus spoke yes. about and called people to. Um, but it, it's, it's the sort of thing I remember reading somewhere else that certain monasteries throughout Europe that were created uh, or built by incredibly um, beautiful monks who loved God and wanted to contemplate his, his word live in a community of people who prayed together and and farmed and looked after the poor and do this huh. centuries later were actually occupied people who use these same buildings as torture chambers for theological opponents it's huh. i mean the, i guess the the big thing is to, to to remember that we're living in a war zone planet earth is is not anybody who thinks that everything that happens down here is god's will is is you know to me I don't know. I don't Very know how naive. to Very it's, naive. It's, yeah, yes. God has is, is, is called us to obey him because it's really important that we do, because we have a choice. And if we don't, especially if we call ourselves his, then uh, then his name is defamed. And then and people okay. are destroyed and peoples are yes. destroyed. And Christianity and, 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 well, I guess human beings have... The ability to represent God, but it might cost you your life, as as, as Jesus demonstrated and others have since. Um, and to do all, uh, and I guess the worst of all is to be lukewarm, as to uh, say we identify with God, yes. but that we misrepresent yes. Him. That's right. that's uh, yeah. I, I'm I think that um, the wrath of God, you know, back to that discussion. Is probably going to be most clear against people who actually claim. I mean, didn't Jesus say, "If you were blind, then you wouldn't be guilty," but because <laughs> you say we see, you yes. are more guilty of sin. It's it's that same thing yes. again. So much of what Jesus said in his first century context just plays out to exactly what Jesus is warning his followers against. Um, actually, plays out in within the church again. Not everywhere. Yes. Not all peoples. Yes. But it's certainly there, and we, we, so I think that we have each individual living today, watching your thing. We have this responsibility to to focus on what Jesus said. He he represents the Father. He is the Son of the Father, and tells us what what's required. And be very careful and, and hold everything that the church teaches. Unless it really does exactly match what Jesus says, which occasionally it will, or sometimes, or often, depending on your church. Yes. But anything that goes against, hold it, hold it loosely or at an arm's distance or reject it outright. Um, there is no authority that God gives men to go against the authority he, he gave his son. And anything yes. else, and, 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 it's, and, and history is messy. Um, and our, 
religious expressions and traditions have grown up in this messy environment. And I'm sure I still fall, you know, and fail to see some of my, you know, um, actions or, or thoughts, you know, sort of okay. in that area. I'm still working yes. on it. We all okay. are. So let me ask you this. Would you be willing to come on again to, to talk about the African subject? Okay. So why don't we close out just by giving the audience a little bit of uh, appreciation for what the topic is going to be. And I'll, I'll say what the topic is, and you could kind of fill it in if I, if I don't have it 100% correct. But the paper that you wrote is concerning how the colonial Christian uh, influence came into Africa and then in the 1960s when the coloni colonialists left Africa the expectation was that Christianity was going to collapse in the African continent yeah and your paper deals with the reality that instead of Christianity collapsing um, because you, you mentioned there were like seven million Christians in Africa at the time that the colonialists left. And then after they left, there was this explosion of, Christ if I can say this, explosion of Christianity that occurred in Africa. And everyone was wondering, how did this happen? Hmm. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's, what, that's what we would like to talk about in the, in the next interview. So I don't know if you, ha you have something, some more interesting details to add just to, to uh, perk up the audience's ears. So yeah, there was apparently about seven million Christians in Africa in the year 1900, and 1900. Okay. by 2015 there's 560 million, okay. um, which okay. which is the main, and just then that's just south of the Sahara. And um, I start by doing some simple arithmetic that based on um, uh, those numbers, that's 13,000 people being added every day <laughs> for for 115 years. Well, so if, if if Luke could get pretty excited in Acts 2 about 3,000 being added to the day, you know, to, to the uh, people of God in, in um, uh, the day of Pentecost, then uh, uh, 13,000 people being added every day for 115 years. Now, again, how we measure that Christianity, uh, my paper talks about the details. If that's just people who okay. identify as Christians, so whether they're truly following Christ, you or I will never know. But it's a dramatic change. And as you say, in the 60s, um, when the colonials put out, because it was struggling, it, that, that growth was definitely not linear. It was struggling to grow, and people expected that when the colonials and the you know, Christian um, priests, etc., pulled out in the 60s, that it would collapse, and perhaps Islam would take over. But actually, the the growth uh, took a completely different trajectory. Okay. And why is I think a question that we should all be asking and learning from. Okay. Okay. So why don't we leave, leave with that question hanging with the hope and expectation, God willing, that we'll get back together now that you've been introduced and now that we've had this time to, to talk in general and we'll deal with this very important subject in the future. Great. Okay? Thanks, Tom. Sound good? Well, thank yep. the Lord and you, Brother Rowan, for taking this time out on kind of a spur of the moment. And uh, I'll look forward to meeting up with you, you again. And uh, 